We will call the meeting of the uh, the recess meeting of the Board of Aldermen of the City of Starkville to order. This is Tuesday, October the 15th. If you would, we would uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. We'll follow that by an invocation by Chaplain Thomas Rogers of the Josie Creek Missionary Baptist Church, and then a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Chaplain Rogers. <coughs> Father in heaven, we thank you again for thank you, thank you. your many blessings and acts of kindness upon us as your people here in the Stark community. We thank you, Lord, for the leadership you have given in our mayor and in the Alderman and the Alderman woman. We thank you, Lord, for these your people that you are adding and you will add to our city, that our function will be as that which is pleasing to you. We ask you, Lord, to guide our hearts and guide our minds. Lord, that all we do and say will, Lord, bring you joy and pleasure. And we know when you're pleased, we're blessed as your people. We thank you for all things. We do ask these things in the name of our Christ, Christ of God. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you being here this evening. And uh, we will go first to the uh, approval of the official agenda, including consented items. Do we have any amendments to the agenda, either consented or as it's labeled uh, on the official agenda? Any changes? Any changes? All right. Seeing none, do I have a motion to approve the official agenda with the consented items as, as outlined? I'll approve, Mayor. I have a motion from Alderman Little. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Second from Alderman Walker. Further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And I will read the uh, consented items. Consideration of the minutes of the September 27, 2019 work session of the Mayor and Board of Aldermen of the City of Starkville. Under Mayor's Business, B, consideration of a resolution to enter into an agreement with the Municipal Intercept Company, LLC, to collect the City of Starkville debt as authorized by the Local Government Debt Collection Setoff Act, House Bill Number 991, 2019 regular session of the Mississippi Legislature. Under the planning, A, consideration of calling for three public hearings for the adoption of the Unified Code to be held November the 12th, 2019, December the 3rd, 2019, and December the 17th, 2019. C, is consideration of final plat 19-08, a request for a final plat approval for subdividing 348.81 parcels into six lots for North Star Industrial Park. This property is located at 1629 Highway 389 in the M1 zone with a parcel number 115-21-007.01, 115-21-007.00, and 115-21-010.02 with conditions. Under engineering, we have authorization for Cody Burnett to participate in the educational assistance program for the fall 2019 semester to take master's level courses in civil engineering with a total reimbursement cost not to exceed $1,600. Under finance administration, number two is consideration of acceptance of the September financial statements. Number three, consideration of the fiscal year 2019 budget amendments. Under the fire department, we have number one, request permission to apply for a hazardous materials emergency preparedness grant program to be awarded by the U.S. Department of Transportation, Pipeline, and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration in the amount of $43,112.71 with a 75-25 match, with a 75% to be reimbursed and the remaining 25% to be paid from machinery and equipment budget. Number two is request authorization for Clarence Parks to travel to Montgomery, Alabama to attend the Scott Firefighter Combat World Challenge 28 in 2019, October 20th through the 27th, 2019, at an approximate cost of $600. Under human resources, number one is request authorization to hire Joe Dan Baker as a lead maintenance worker in the Parks and Recreation Department. Number two is request authorization to advertise for a field maintenance worker in the Starville Parks and Recreation Department. Number three is request authorization to advertise for a code enforcement officer in the Community Development Department. Number four, request authorization to advertise for a firefighter in the Starkville Fire Department. Under parks, we have consideration of approval to purchase youth basketball jerseys from Rex Team Sports in the amount of $8,500, $8, the lowest of four quotes. 
In the police department, we have number one, consideration to purchase a 2020 Dodge Charger at $22,493 off state contract with forfeited funds. Number two is consideration to purchase two solar-powered radar signs from EconoSigns, the lowest bidder in the amount of $5,578.12 with $3,760 to be reimbursed from the fiscal year 20 JAG grant. Under the Sanitation Department, number one is request authorization to purchase a front-end loader from Sansom Equipment Company, Inc., the lowest bidder in the amount of $280,000 with the city clerk to obtain financing quotes. Under the Utilities Department, number one is request authorization to advertise for bids for 30 single-phase 7.62 kV voltage regulators, material only, one control and relay house, material only, and the construction of the Southwest Startwell 161-6913 kV substation. Number two is request authorization to accept the lowest and best total base bid and additive alternative from J&P Construction in the amount of $7,723,200 for the Ernest E. Jones Wastewater Treatment Plant Biosolids Improvements. And that closes out the consent agenda items that were on, on the agenda. Next we have, uh, the next item up will be uh, consideration of the minutes of the September 17th, 2019 Mayor of the Board of Aldermen, Mayor and Board of Aldermen, City of Startwell. Do I have a motion for approval? Move approval. I have a motion for Alderman Sistrunk. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Alderman Little. Discussion? Yeah, Alderman Vaughn. Mr. City Attorney. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Before I vote on these minutes, I'm like my kid, Allah always tell me, I don't want to go to court about no minutes. Are they even minutes legally and been blessed by you? Yes, sir. I want to go to court. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Any further discussion? I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Perkins. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I um, would be remiss if I did not make some comments at this time. Uh, the gentleman from Seven uh, raised some very interesting and, and interesting question. And I'm seeking recognition at this time as an officer of the court and as a member of this board, I do need to address that question that was raised by the gentleman from Seven. And I'm going to say this, uh, as I do with all my remarks and comments, as professionally and with integrity and with respect as I always do. And if I didn't respond to this question, then I would feel that I would not have fulfilled the, uh, the duties that I've been sworn to fulfill. Uh, before us at this time, and Mayor, I will uh, inform the, the floor when I yield the floor, and otherwise I have not announced yield, then the floor hopefully is still mine. Uh, the gentleman from Seven asked a question, this is to everybody who's listening in, and I want everybody to pay close attention because this not only pertains to the minutes of this uh, particular meeting of uh, September 17, 2019, but this it's going to have some very long-lasting effect and implication beyond my time and service uh, as a member of this Board of Aldermen. And this tape is going to probably be pulled from the archives at some point, even once I am gone and left this earth, because someone is going to want to refer back and look and see, regardless of what the outcome may be, but they want to know what was said on this matter. Uh, right before the board now, there's been a motion in second. I'm going to uh, just analyze this. I'm going to take my time um, on this tonight. I only seek uh, recognition when I feel that it's necessary and proper. But the matter that is at hand tonight at this moment is, is the approval of the minutes of the um, meeting of the mayor and board of aldermen of uh, Tuesday, September 17, 2019. In order for me to make a decision as to whether or not uh, I vote in the uh, affirmative or the negative on this question, uh, first of all, I must uh, know all the facts. And the first question that comes before the Vice Mayor and Attorney Roy A. Perkins is, and, and of course been practicing law for 31 years and been on this board now for uh, in excess of 26 years and three months, and, and of course I've um, sat through um, a number of boards, is um, my seventh term here. So the question is, is uh, 
was the meeting that was held on Tuesday, September 17, 2019, a legal, a lawful meeting that was held in compliance with um, state law. The meeting that, um, that arose prior to September 17, um, 2019 was held on Tuesday, September 3, 2019. At the conclusion of that meeting, the um, board, as it always do, it, it took official action. Um, and this is a serious matter. It may not be serious to some, but it should be. Uh, but uh, the board made a motion that it would be in recess until 5.30 p.m. on Tuesday, September 17, 2019. And what I'm about to tell you, uh, not only to those in this room, but all those who are streaming live, I want you to get it correct. Um, and, and what I'm about to say, the video evidence supports what I'm about to say. And the video evidence is the, um, is the recording of this meeting as it existed on, on September. Well, that's, I'm going to just say the assembly, rather. I'm not going to call it a meeting. But, but on September the 17th, 20. 19, um, according to the video evidence, there were three aldermen uh, at this table and four aldermen, absent including myself, and, this, uh, and the city attorney and the city clerk and the mayor was present. And uh, the, um, the uh, law is real clear in this state. Uh, there's a, a provision of law that is uh, codified under the Code Charter Form of Government, and that section is 21-3 dash 19 of the Mississippi Code of 1972 is amended. There is uh, a sentence in that subsection one. There are two subsections in that, in that section. The next to the last sentence in that subsection, uh, it says, it reads just like this. I'm going to analyze these words. And, and when I yield this, it's going to be the substance of my, of my uh, statements tonight. But that sentence says, and I'm going to quote it, it says, in all cases, I'm going to come back and, and dissect this and as we talk about these minutes, because this is a very scholarly uh, discussion here. But it says, in all cases, it didn't say some or one or two or three. It says, in all cases, it shall be the duty and the requirement of the alderman. Um, in other words, to, in, order, in, order, in order to transact business of the board of aldermen, there sh it requires a quorum. In all cases, it shall require a quorum of all aldermen to constitute a quorum to transact business. Let me say that again. In all cases, it shall require, and of course the legislature didn't use the word may, which is permissive. It didn't use the word, it uses the word shall. Shall is mandatory, non-discretionary requirement. It shall, it shall require a majority of all aldermen to constitute a quorum for the transaction of business. That's what the law in this state, that's state law. 21-3-19 subsection 1 of the Mississippi Code of 1972 is amended. The board on September 3, 2019 recessed until 5.30 p.m. on Tuesday, September 17, 2019. When, the, when this assembly came live on the air, the presiding officer made it clear that there is no meeting. The presiding officer of this governing body made it clear that it is no meeting. The presiding officer made it clear that I can't call it a meeting. We're just here. We're just existing. That's what the presiding officer said. It's like we never met. The presiding officer of this governing body said, we're going to stay here for 30 minutes so that hopefully at least the board or at least one other alderman can show up so we can transact business. And the reason that was necessary because the, um, the presiding officer and the other three in attendance were in need of a quorum to 
transact business. Remember now, I just told you where the legislature say in all, it didn't say in one case or two cases or three cases, it say in all cases. That means every, in every case there exists, it shall, it didn't say it may, it shall require a quorum of the alderman to transact business. And a quorum is a majority of this board. So and even um, once it was established that there was not a quorum present and, and the, um, the, the presiding officer never recognized and, and even made it real clear throughout the first 30 minutes of the, of the assembly. It was no meeting, it was just an assembly of people here. Under state law, the word meeting is defined in the uh, Open Meetings Act, section 25-41-3 at second, other section of the Mississippi Code of 1972 is amended. The, the word meeting means an assemblage of members of a governing body to transact official business within the authority, the jurisdiction, the control of the body. Under no parliamentary procedure can you transact business uh, without a majority. And that's why the chair at this first session said that, that, well, I can't adjourn it because there's nothing to adjourn. It never existed, it never happened, do you hear me? It never existed, it never happened. And even before the first person came up and the, the citizens comment at that assembly it wasn't a meeting ladies and gentlemen because the chair recognized that and when the first person came up it was stated well you know just come on up and speak to us you know we're not a meeting we're just we're just here we're just here under the law that I quoted to you you cannot transact business unless you have a quorum a quorum is a majority of members of this board. So if you don't have four, you cannot transact business. And remember now, the board speaks through its minutes. That's why I'm taking the time tonight to speak to this. I'm not worried about how, what the votes may be, but we need to make sure we get this legal discussion because this is the people's business. It's not about the messenger here. You know, I've been this long enough, and just like I go to court and practice law, I just make sure I just do what I'm required to do. But but this is the people's business because at that particular meeting, it was stated when that first citizen came up that, you know, that we're not in a meeting. We're just here, but we can at least hear from the people who have some citizens' comments. So given the fact that the board speaks through its minutes, the board recessed until 5.30 p.m. on Tuesday, September 17, 2019. So what happens when 5.30 comes and you don't have a court? Now, based on my legal opinion, regardless of what somebody else says, regardless of what another lawyer t tells you, regardless of what the Attorney General's office tells you, because the, the Attorney General's office is just an opinion. You know, they, they're, it's not speaking from a court of law, and the Supreme Court has talked about complying with the requirements of the, of the Open Meetings Law. So, you know, there has to be a quorum to transact official business. So even at from 5.30 when there was no quorum and when 5.31 came, you know, uh, that, that particular setting was over. You, the, the meeting was recessed. It wasn't recessed to 6.10. Remember now, the board speaks through its minutes. When the board made the motion on September 3, 2019, it recessed, ladies and gentlemen, until 5.30. This will have a time certain. Because who do we speak through? Not through the vice mayor. You don't speak through the general from seven. You don't speak through no other alderman. You don't speak through nobody else. You speak through, or we speak through our minutes. So what did the minutes say that we recessed until 5.30 p.m. on Tuesday, September 17, 2019. So when 5.31 come, you go home. Now one thing I want to applaud the chair about, the chair did recognize something, the, the, the solution to the matter, but the solution, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm saying this in all great respect, all great respect, nothing negative here. It's just a legal discussion. One thing that the chair did recognize from my listening to the tape 
in seeing the tape was that we need to call, or not she, she didn't say, uh, the chair didn't say uh, we need to call, so I'm going to call a special call meeting. But that never happened. Now, once 530 came and there was no quorum, the only remedy was, was to go home and, and, um, and meet at the next meeting or a special call meeting by state law, which could have been called by the, the chief executive officer of this city or any two aldermen, provided that at least three hours of advance notice is given and all the subjects are articulated. So when 610 comes, there was a non-member at this table, a non-member a non, a non, um, of this governing body, and wasn't the mayor, and wasn't an alderman, said at 610 that the board stands in recess. If you're going to stand in recess, it takes an official act. To continue a meeting takes to do anything. For us to do anything, that's why we had the consent agenda and this agenda, because it takes an official act. If you're talking about continuing anything, you're talking about continuing a meeting or continuing a discussion or tabling a discussion, it requires an official act. This assembly of persons that was here or constituted here, not it was never a meeting, that was here at 610 on Tuesday, February, on, on, on Tuesday, September the 17th, 2019, could not transact any business. So, given the fact that only three aldermen were present, there was no way you can recess a meeting until 9 o'clock that night or even 7 o'clock that night. Why could that not be done? Because remember that the statute says that in all cases, it don't say one case or two case or three case or four case, it says in all cases, it shall, and shall is, means you don't have any discretion. You gotta do it, you must do it, you shall do it, you gotta do it. It shall require a majority of all. It didn't say a majority of, one, of two aldermen, it didn't say of three, it didn't say of four, it didn't say of five, it didn't say of six. And, and we have a total of seven aldermen. It, so a, a quorum mean, means four of those in order to constitute or transact business. So there was no way you can come in at 610 without a, a, a quorum and continue or recess a meeting until a, a, a later time. And the chair had clearly, had clearly recognized that we are not in a meeting because it's just like it never happened. Now, if someone wants to contradict that, I'll, put, I'll, I'll, I'll call for the tape on it. And then here it comes. We come fast forward from 610. And of course, if you had a special call notice issue, then it would have required uh, at least three hours notice and notice all the board members. So what happens at 9 o'clock that night, listen to me, ladies and gentlemen, at 9 o'clock on Tuesday, September 17, 2019, according to the video evidence. The, you have five aldermen present, and, and I'll be, be transparent, uh, the vice mayor and, and number seven were absent. And the presiding officer says, I now call the September 17 recess meeting of the Board of Aldermen to, to order. There was no authority to call the meeting to order at nine o'clock at night. Remember that we speak through our minutes. Did we recess tonight? We last met on September the 3, 2019. We recessed at 530, not tonight. You know, and the chair made it uh, known that there were important items in, this, um, in, the, in that agenda, which was a, a number of things to include but not limited to. Uh, the budget, the millage, the compensation plan, among other things. But nobody in this country is above the law. Whether you're in Washington, D.C., or in Starkville, Mississippi, that includes the vice mayor, nobody is above the law. 
And speaking about this man is that there's some mention too about sending the police to round up those that weren't here. That none of us have violated the law. But back to these minutes, there was no meeting that was ever held. Regardless of who says to the contrary, I feel I can defend that in any court of competent jurisdiction. Given my 31 years of practicing law, my years of administrative experience, my years uh, of 26 years in, in excess of 26 years and three months as an alderman, my background as a um, in parliamentary procedure, background is boy. The only thing, I'm not trying to show anybody up. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a person of, of high character, of high integrity, a person of class and professionalism. This is just a scholarly discussion. I'm not, this is nothing negative. I'm just talking to the public. I just want to make sure, because the minutes going to probably get approved, but, but I just want the people to know that we speak through our minutes. If this happens this time, don't let this be no precedent. Because this precedent will eat you alive because I've seen time after time that one board will say, well, this other board did it that way. That, and that means they believe it was right. Because if these minutes get approved tonight, gentlemen from seven with your question, then it makes it appear that you can come in here on any given time and transact business with at least three people and the presiding officer and say that the meeting stand and recess. How can you recess a meeting without an official act? And the law is just telling you, you got to have a quorum. You know, and the, and, and the people need to get understanding, the press needs to get a good understanding. You need to understand what the law says before you start being critical of people about these minutes and this meeting. Because the law states that in all cases, it shall require a majority of all aldermen to transact business. So the meeting, as the chair thought, and, and, and probably thought that, at 9 o'clock it was said that the September 17th recess meeting of the mayor and board of aldermen is called to order. The, the board never recessed at 9 o'clock. There was no meeting at 531. You either go home or a special call meeting is to be issued pursuant to Title 21 of the Mississippi Code of 72 is amended. It was an easy fix. But it was just a matter of trying to move forward and we are not above the law. We want to hold people accountable within our jurisdiction but we have minutes right before us right now. I'm talking about these minutes and, I'm, and the reason I'm talking about them because we have to as a governing body comply with the law. There was no meeting. Even in our rules of pr our procedure defines a meeting, you have to have a, um, a quorum to legally transact business. Even if the mayor is absent, if she's in New York or Washington DC or Canada or in, in England, if I'm presiding and three aldermen shows up at 530, I'm going to tell them that we can't have a meeting. We don't have a quorum. And that's what are the facts here. Ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to give you the facts. I'm about to conclude here. And can the vice mayor vote for this motion? The answer to that question is easy. Because why? I cannot do it because there was no meeting. I cannot approve minutes of a meeting that, was, that never happened. Any meeting that was allegedly occurred was unlawful. Any meeting that allegedly occurred on September 17, 2019 was improper. Any meeting that allegedly occurred on September 17, 2019 was against the law. Any meeting that allegedly occurred on September 17, 2019 was not in compliance with the Open Meetings Act. And the law is going to supersede any rule of procedure. And even in our rules of procedures, it states that it shall be the duty of the presiding officer to declare the assembly or meeting adjourned when there's no quorum. Now, of course, you can go through the rule book and pull things out that is favorable to one side or another, but I'm talking about the law. 
You know, the Supreme Court, as we talk about these amendments, it has given a number of cases talking about compliance with the Open Meetings Act. So the point that I want to make from this discussion, the reason I wanted to be so involved, because I want to make sure everybody do not miss a single point on what I'm saying. I'm not talking negative to anybody. I'm not talking down to anybody. But it's very important as we proceed. And, in, in, you know, an alderman are going to be absent from time to time. None of us are ever perfect with anything. Nobody is perfect. There's no perfect attendance. There's nothing perfect about any of us about life. There are deficiencies in one place or another, but at the same time, we got to comply with the law. If you recognize there's an out of compliance with the law, then we need to make sure. Now, what happens, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if we don't, if, if this motion is defeated? It still is an easy fix. It may not be a timely fix, but all you got to do is just, you know, put it back on the uh, on agenda at a duly called meeting and, and just make sure you get it right. You got the millage involved. You got the budget involved. You got employee compensation. Everything that we do is important. And, and these minutes, one other thing I want to say uh, about these minutes, at the very top of these minutes, it talk about that the meeting was called to the recess meeting of at the 530 recess meeting of, of September 17, 2019. <coughs> there was no 530 recess meeting. Do you understand at 530, you only had three aldermen here? Only three aldermen, there was no majority, so you couldn't have a meeting. So anything happened that night or thereafter, unless it was a special call meeting, which it wasn't, then it was, it was not legal, it was not lawful, it was not proper. It was in violation of the law. So given this discussion, these minutes should but not likely, they should, but not likely, be defeated. And I'm not saying this to uh, bolster some point, but you know I just want to be consistent, as I have done for over or in excess of 26 years and three months at this table. So I wanted to say that so we can realize the importance of it now. And after I yield the floor, it's not about why somebody missed or who was here or why somebody missed. The point is do not approve these minutes because there was never a meeting and the chair recognized that on more than one occasion. 530. We're, the chair said, ladies and gentlemen, we are at a point where we do not have a quorum. Why was that statement important? Because we cannot transact business. You cannot tra transact business without a quorum. You cannot recess a meeting. If, to recess a meeting from one time to another time requires an official act. And I just told you, or informed you respectfully, that in order to transact official business, you got to have um, a majority. You got to be an official meeting. So anything less than three, you just assemble it. It's just an assemblage of people. A meeting is a, uh, is a, a group of the governing body when they're assembled and can act officially. That's why the chair said we, it's like we never met. We're not in a meeting. And the chair astutely recognized that. Didn't try to hide it on camera. The chair made it clear on more than one occasion. We're not in a meeting. We're not in a meeting. It's just like we, we did not met, meet. The lawyer was here. He heard it. He didn't try to stop it because he knew that. He, he's, a, he's a smart lawyer. He, he, he knew that. He knew that. He knew that there was no core. So that point is undisputed. Now, if someone uh, disagree about what I think happened out, you know, we can pull the tape up. The tape is the best evidence if you don't believe the vice mayor. I've seen it more than one occasion. I've done my homework. I feel that I'm right. I have a strong belief in what I'm saying. If I was practicing law, somebody came in, I feel I could win it. I feel I can win it. Probably get, I feel I can get a unanimous decision. Feel just that strong. So, um, Mayor, I, as I said, I just wanted to make sure that I just mentioned this a point. I mean, uh, I'm not going to be back and forth on it, regardless of who has something to say about him. It's not the issue. Is as I get ready to yield, the issue is not about why somebody didn't show up. The issue at this point is the minutes. We speak through our minutes. Was it a legal meeting? The meeting, as I represent to you 
based upon my expertise and background, years of training, was, was no meeting. Matter of fact, it was not only, it was, it, it was not only a no meeting, even if someone says a meeting, it's illegal. They comply with the law. Never, open meetings law does not allow that. That's why you recess to a time certain so you can give the public proper notice. You just can't come in and do what you want to. That's why we have the laws that govern that. That's what the uh, court told the city of Columbus back there in the case of 2017, city of Columbus versus commercial dispatch. The issues were different, but the point was the, the court, the Supreme Court and the Ethics Commission and the Chancellor Judge in this district told the city of Columbus, you got to comply with the law. Now, of course, the facts were different, but we we're talking about the open means law. So that's all, you know, I'm, that's why I'm here to lend my ex expertise um, to the citizens of Starkville. I'm going to represent, and you know, some people may think I'm just unnecessarily taking time, but, but that's how we do in law. When we go to court, we have to make our point, because when I sit down and rest my case, Your Honor, Your Honor, um, what says the, the plaintiff of the defense? We tender, Your Honor, and when I sit down, I'm through, because I need to hope I get a favorable decision. So I just want to make sure I take the necessary time, and hopefully the taxpayers of this city will appreciate what the vice mayor has said. And hopefully the taxpayers will thank um, for this information. I think it will be beneficial down the road, even though if the decision, which I don't think is going to be, be changed tonight. But I'm not saying it trying to, um, you know, I mean, uh, change somebody's heart. But hopefully it will. But we need to do what is legally correct. But the, but the focal point of these minutes, and the only reason I brought this up, because it needs to be said, and, and the board approved these minutes tonight. It just needs to know that some consequences could follow because the meeting would never happen. And then it certainly does not need this, this precedent because, you know, I don't question why members don't be here. I've seen members absent all over 26 years in, in three months. I've seen members miss consecutive meetings. I don't be worried about I just make sure I'm, I show up, take care of my business. I don't try to keep up with the Joneses. I just worry about the vice mayor being here. I don't worry about why this person, I'm not going to call it disgraceful or shameful or whatever you say. I just make sure I'm here and transact business. I got the general from five here, not here tonight. This is my colleague. Man, I'm, I'm not getting his personal business while he's not here tonight. That's his business. I just recognize him as a distinguished colleague. If he absent in the next meeting, that's his business. If he absent in the next meeting, that's his business. That's not for me to get into. My job is to be a professional, but as we look at these minutes, um, I'm going to ask the board, given all that discussion, um, you know, um, that, we, um, that we defeat these minutes and, um, and the remedy for that, you know, the mayor can call a special call meeting, put these items on the agenda, and the board can take action. They only have to have three hours notice. I'll be in town for the rest of the week, um, except for in the morning. And, um, uh, and I'll be in court Thursday, but I'll be here and or you know we can have a special call meeting and put them on the next agenda. We can just take these matters up, but that's what needs to happen, regardless of what the outcome. It'll be it is what it is when when the board re takes them up again. But Mayor, I just wanted to say thank you for um, for allowing you, the vice mayor to say that, and you can tell that it was really on my heart to say that, and and certainly I didn't say it to. Um, to cast any negative shadow on anybody. And I think my words were carefully articulated and, uh, and pronounced. Uh, so it was very clear to everybody who's listening to know how sincere I am with my role as an attorney and the vice mayor as an officer of the court. So, um, and hopefully, you know, that, you know, I mean, however the board votes, you know, we're going to go on to the next item. But, I, but, this is, but these, when I saw these minutes, they've been weighing heavily on me. And I feel that I need to say that. And now I've said it. And um, Mayor, I'm going to yield the floor. Thank you. Any further discussion? Alderman McCarver. Uh, City Attorney, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, my thoughts are that, as always, I immensely respect the Vice Mayor's experience and his opinion and point of view on this. We just respectfully differ, and he and I have talked about this, so his comments are not a surprise to me tonight. Where we differ is I don't believe any official business took place until 9 o'clock when a quorum showed up. The Mayor did open the meeting at some point before 6, 10 p.m., and then she called for a recess break or an in-meeting break to see if a quorum would develop. Our procedure is governed by the standard code of parliamentary procedure. And in that book it says, if a quorum is not present, it may be possible to take action to obtain a quorum. 
in my mind, with the budget pending and the millage pending, that was the action that the chair took to see if a quorum would develop at 9 o'clock by Alderman Little's plane landing and whoever else would be up. So, in my mind, uh, it's compliant. So, was the meeting started without a quorum? The meeting, the standard code of parliamentary procedure says the chair can open a meeting without a quorum and she can take reports and hear citizen comments, which is exactly what happened. Uh, I don't know exactly what she said at the beginning of the meeting, but I know at some point she said, I'm officially opening this meeting before she called for a recess break at 610. Then instead of having a 10 minute Coke break, there was a two hour break to get us to nine o'clock PM when a quorum was here and then the board conducted business. So you have comfort in voting for these minutes tonight? I do, I think they're legal. Vice Mayor, do you have further comments? Y y yes, yes ma'am, just very briefly. Uh, Mr. Uh, Clemens, um, uh, let me, I'll make one comment I want to direct a question, Mr. Clemens. Um, the attorney uh, referenced the quorum, and, uh, and under that book it says a quorum is the number or proportion of the members of an organization that must be present at a meeting in order to transact business legally. We didn't have a quorum. Mr. Clemens, do you have the capability, Chef's about, I only want to spend about four or five minutes. Do you have the capability from this room to show me the beginning of the six o'clock session? I want to spend about five or seven minutes and I'm gonna move on. Just do you have the capability from here to show me what was said at the very beginning of six o'clock and nine o'clock? Then we'll move on. Yes, sir, I, can, I can pull that video. Pull it up. And that the attorney the facts differ from mine. And I'll tell you when to stop the first one. Is that the beginning of it? Yeah, back to that point, right there, where she said you'll notice. Turn up a little bit. Could you go about the six minutes over there, about six minutes and 30 seconds over? I think she'll talk more about that uh, six minutes in that area. Okay. Yeah, but in that area. Thank you. 
Mr. Uh, will, uh, will you fast forward to nine o'clock? Yes, on that clicker there. Mr. Clement, this is at 9 o'clock on September 17th? Yes, sir. Okay, play just the, the mayor's opening remarks. Yes, sir. Good. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'll call the meeting at the recess meeting of the September 17th Board of Aldermen meeting order. Thank you, Mr. Clement. Mayor, just in closing, I just, uh, that video just confirms what I said, that there was no meeting and that the uh, alleged meeting was not called to order until until nine o'clock, and 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 for those reasons, just support what I was saying. And I just only offer that after my after my distinguished colleague from Lafayette, the, the, my distinguished colleague of law. I mean, I just wanted to make sure I just brought those points out so the record be clear what happened, and then when the meeting was called to order. So it wasn't called to order until nine, and so for all the reasons, I feel that in you know, my opinion stand. And I yield, Mayor. Thank you. Mayor. All right. I'm, Arm gone. I heard you say it's a shame that we're not here. I've been here 10 years, I only missed five. What's such a shame about because I, I wasn't at the meeting? You knew earlier, I told you I was sick. But exactly. I never, you never say nothing about nobody else missing no meeting, but it's a shame for us not to come to the meeting. How could you say that? Um, I'd be happy to discuss with you elsewhere. Yes. The shame was that we didn't have a quorum, and that is a shame. Anything God. further? All right, we've got a motion to hey. second. Yeah. Alderman Walker. Yeah, I just want to. Uh, I appreciate the, the comments that were, that were made, and I am not a lawyer, um, but I would again ask the, the city attorney, um, was the actions that were that we that took place that night, all, in your opinion, legal uh, by everything that we did in terms of the, the meeting and the procedure and the effects of what was passed that night? I think so. Thank you. All right. No further discussion. All those in favor? Please signify, uh, tell you what, let's do this by roll call. Would you answer yay or nay as the city clerk calls your name? Alderman Carver. Yay. Alderman Sistrunk. Yay. Alderman Little. Yay. Alderman Walker. Yay. Vice Mayor Perkins. Nay. Alderman Bond. Nay. All right, by a vote of four to two, motion carries. Thank you. All right, Mayor's comments next will be, um, I have the opportunity to which is always a pleasure to uh, introduce these gentlemen who are sitting on, I'm sorry, who are sitting on the front row patiently, gentlemen and ladies, sitting on the front row patiently. Um, I had the pleasure of swearing them in, and now I get to introduce them to the board, which is a wonderful thing. So um, if you would please, I will introduce, starting with Jonathan Luttrell. Mr. Luttrell is uh, from Bolivar, Tennessee, and is a graduate of Bolivar Central High School. Before becoming a member of the Startwell Police Department, Jonathan was a police officer for the city of Boonville. Jonathan enjoys spending time with his three children, as well as baseball, football, and riding motorcycles. Welcome. Next is Isaac Johnson. Mr. Johnson is originally from Belmont, Mississippi. He is a graduate of Mississippi State University with a bachelor's degree in criminology. Isaac was a security supervisor at the resort at Pelican Hill in Newport Coast, California before joining the Startwell Police Department. Isaac enjoys hanging out with his wife, Jessica, and he stays active by playing sports. He attends Second Street Church of Christ in Belmont. Welcome. Next, we have Darnell Madison. Darnell is from Birmingham, Alabama, and is a graduate of Tarrant High School. He attended Southeastern Bible College. Prior to joining the Starkville Police Department, Darnell worked as a police officer for the city of Columbus. When time permits, Darnell enjoys spending time with his wife, Ariel, and their two children. He also enjoys football and watching movies. And last but not least, Valika Nash. Valika is from Starkville and is a graduate of Starkville High School. She attended Mississippi State University where she majored in criminology. 
Before joining the Starkville Police Department, Velika was employed with the Octobaha County Sheriff's Department. During her free time, Velika enjoys spending time with her daughter and taking a few quiet moments for herself. <laughs> Velika and her family attend Second Baptist Church in Starkville. Please join me in welcoming all of our new police officers. Thank you all so much. We greatly appreciate you coming with us. All right. And next, I have one other item that I was going to mention. We have uh, this week, we have Pumpkin Palooza, which I know is always enjoyed by everyone. It's from 5 to 7 on Main Street on Thursday this year. Normally, it is on a Friday, but in this case, it's on a Thursday. So hopefully, everyone will come out. We close the streets and put hay in the streets and give candy out and, and just generally have a good time. So please, please join the partnership in the city as we uh, host a, a Halloween type of event. So, um, all right, Board of Alderman comments. Anyone from Board of Alderman? All right, seeing none, we move to citizens' comments. Um, and this is an opportunity for anyone to have three minutes to say about any particular topic to the board, what they are interested in saying. Uh, it's timed by uh, our city clerk. And what I, before we begin, one of the things I'd like to ask, is anyone here for the place type maps discussion, public hearing on place types maps? Okay, all right, then uh, citizen comments. Mr. Turner, you are in line, please join us. Green team man grew up in Nathan Town and Tony. Um, to the mayor, to the police chief, to the NACP, President uh, Yolanda Head. Uh, to the mayor, it's good that the NACP attend these meetings. And uh, I want to thank you for uh, swearing me in as the Vice President of the NACP, our tip our county, for the voice of the people. Uh, I will be uh, completing one year this coming January when I have another year coming. You're welcome, it, Mr. Sherman. Huh? I was just saying you're welcome. Uh, um, uh, now, uh, the NACP is to let the to let the, to to so like be the listening voice for the community. I, I was at the meeting in our uh, in, in in our oath, let the oath that we take, let know that when it becomes where we cannot conduct ourselves like we should, we should step down. That that is not our in our. Uh, Long, long as I'm able, I'm gonna do what I can for the city of Star because you all are taking care of me, and that that's a help to everyone. Now, our uh, own uh, Wood Street, on um, Wood Street, and in, in uh, Louisville Street, our uh, that little that, that little opening there is not big enough. In time, we'll go back next month, and it it will be dark and it would be dangerous that we need a flashing light or something so that we won't run over one another from Louisville Street into Wood Street, from Wood Street into Louisville Street. All right, that is just a concern of the citizens are, uh, because those buses have to swing out, and I don't know how long those buses are. But our, uh, it's sad when you our, uh, say that you are for the citizens of Starfall and then you make them change. Our, uh, and this comes from the vice president of the NACP. Our, uh, if you are elected for a position, you do what you can, and then you be respectable. Our, uh, uh, it's, it, it's no time for being bullied on the playground. Our, uh, either you for the people or you're not. And uh, thank goodness that our, uh, I don't have a whole lot of books in, but uh, I got comments in. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Anyone else wishing to speak in, under citizens' comments? Anyone else? All right, seeing none, I'll close it as citizens' comments. We have no public appearances this evening. We do have, however, our second public hearing and consideration of the, of the updated place type map amendments for the comprehensive plan. Uh, Mr. Hamill and Ms. Corbin have in the past provided us that information. Do we have any questions from the board 
uh, of this, do we want to make another presentation? Uh, okay. All right. Would you like to go ahead? Sure. Have a, have a request for a presentation. And I'll make it brief. All right. Uh, this is just an update of the place type maps of the conference <coughs> plan. The place type maps are similar to what a zoning use map of the past used to be. Uh, the place type map is not a zoning map. It is just intended to translate the language of the comprehensive plan into a map. And then uh, beyond that, it's used by the Board of Aldermen whenever considering any zoning or land use changes uh, being proposed, and it references the comp plan and the place type map. Um, there are several factors that are on page 44 of the comp plan that are used in creating and updating place type maps, inherent land use features, current use, current density and intensity, existing and potential infrastructure, real estate market dynamics, public stakeholders and preferences, current public policies, and planning best practices. When we were going through the place type map, we realized uh, when we were doing the unified code, we went back and referenced the place type map, and we noticed there were several areas, the majority, or errors. The majority of these errors fall in one of three categories, or they exist in a couple of categories at the same time. Misalignments, current use conflicts, and parcels with multiple place types. Um, the misalignments were the easiest to explain. They were created by changing data. Uh, in 2016, we were using 2014 parcel data that was provided by the county. And around 2017, they updated the parcel data, which basically made it more geographically correct. And once they did that, it made it not line up anymore uh, in a GIS system. The next was uh, use conflicts and uh, multiple place types. This was generally, a majority of it was created when the, uh, the removal of a place type of natural area at the last minute on the approval of the comprehensive plan. When that was removed, the areas that were underneath that layer, so to speak, were kind of inconsistently place typed. And so this is just an effort to correct that. And so once we addressed those, then we went parcel by parcel and uh, addressed all, their, all the other use conflicts and place type areas and misalignments. This proposed update will create new maps that will go into the comprehensive plan. There's a total of 23 images in the cover sheet that will be replaced. The maps are found on page 45, 48 through 51, 53 through 56, 59 through 64, 66, 67, 69, and 73. Um, and again, the update of this place type map is the first thing for the Unified Development Code, uh, public hearings and adoption and approval. The, uh, just as an announcement, the second public input session on the Unified Development Code will be on the 22nd in City Hall at 530. And then as the mayor announced earlier, the first public hearing on the Unified Development Code is scheduled for November 12th by the Planning Zone Commission in this building at 530 okay. on November 12th. If there are any questions. Any questions from the board at this point before I open it as a public hearing? Okay, seeing none. I will open it as a public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak about the updated place type map amendments, now would be the opportunity. Anyone wishing to speak about the place type maps? All right, seeing none, I'll close it as a public hearing. This is also allows us to have consideration, since this being our second public hearing. Do I have a motion to approve the place type map as presented? Mayor, move approval. Okay, I have a motion from Alderman Walker. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Alderman Little. Further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. All right, moving next to the public hearing consideration of a conditional use for a request for residential use of C2 commercially zoned property located approximately 700 feet west of the intersection of Lynn Lane and South Montgomery Street with parcel uh, 102I-00-002.01. Mr. Haviland, are you taking this one? Yes. Uh, this is a conditional use request by Slate Cracker to allow for residential use on the C2 property. Uh, the property is located directly west of the Mason DeVille. Let them get the image up.
The applicant is proposing eight single family style residential units, uh, dwelling units. In order to construct dwelling single family detached, a conditional use is required per the city of Starkville's permitted and conditional use chart. The applicant is proposing <coughs> to construct cottage, uh, cottage court style development on the property. This style of development consists of multiple single family homes located on the same parcel but are under condo ownership to where the areas around them are under common ownership, the building themselves are under separate ownership. And what this type of development allows for is that uh, public right of way not be constructed with a cul-de-sac for a fire truck turn around in the middle and people can actually own the property, own the home without touching the right of way. The applicant has provided this conceptual site plan, uh, which appears to meet the city development requirements and is proportionate to the area. This next image is just some examples uh, of what a cottage court can look like uh, in other areas that it has been used. The gross density of the proposed development is plus or minus eight units per acre. The subdivision to the east is 7.85 units per acre. The future subdivision to the south is 3.81 units per acre. 19 property owners of record within 300 feet of the subject property were notified directly by mail of this request. A public hearing was noticed, was published in the Starkville Daily News on September 21st, 2019, and a sign was posted on the property. As of this, this date, the planning office has received one phone call, one email exchange regarding this request. Section A, Article 6, Section 1 of the City's Code of Ordinance provides for five specific criteria for conditional use review and approval. The first is land use compatibility. The proposed use is a dwelling single family detached could be considered compatible with the adjacent properties. The property is currently zoned C2. The 2016 comprehensive plan has the area place type as traditional neighborhood new. Number two is sufficient site size and adequate site specifications to accommodate the proposed use. The site is adequately sized to accommodate the proposed use. Number three is proposed use of mitigative technique. There are none proposed. Number four is hazardous waste. There is no hazardous waste materials would be generated or used or stored at the site. And number five is compliance with applicable laws and ordinances. The applicant is responsible for retaining all the proper permitting uh, required by the city. Okay, thank you, Mr. Havlin. Any questions for Mr. Havlin before I open it as a public hearing? Mr. Carver. <coughs> I say, first of all, most of the complaints I've heard from constituents around the area is obviously more due to the fact of not having homeowner HOA covenants within this development as there are within Massandeville, Riddle Run, and I think Mr. Andy Fournay's development is going to be to the south. So that's my only other question was you said Massandeville is around seven point some units per acre, Riddle, Riddle Run is 3.2, and then what about Mr. the new development, Mr. Andy Fournay's, what is it? Uh, four days was the three point. It's also yeah. It was uh, the actual lower three point eight one. Mason Deville was seven point eight five. And uh, I can speak to the condo association, which is required when you create a condo. And the condo association, unlike an HOA, cannot be dissolved. It has to continuously be in place. So it's not an HOA. It's a condominium association, but it's uh, will exist forever. Thank you. And then some other constituents, uh, we got a lot of emails on this. I know everybody did. And they said there were some verbal agreements or were there written agreements as to what type of covenants would be inside this development. Some felt as if the crackers had verbally committed earlier at an earlier time. Is there some history and truth to that? Or? Uh, the applicant has been uh, in discussions with some of the property owners in Mason DeVille specifically, I believe. I'm not sure if they have with Riddle Run, but they have been kind of talking back and forth on some conditions that they would like to see. And I see the applicant here, so I may ask that question because uh, that's pertaining to some of the emails we got. So. Well, and I was going to let you all ask questions of Mr. Howell and then <coughs> allow the applicant to come up. So are we ready for him Thank to you. come up? Thank you. Have anything further? Okay. If you would, please. And if you would identify yourself for the record, Mr. Yes, Cracker. I'm Slade Cracker. Um, I am the owner of this property I purchased about a year and a half ago as a C2 commercial lot as an investment and uh, based off of uh, location, location, location. That's a good location for a lot of things. And we were really close in negotiations with uh, OCH for urgent care to be built on this property. But that didn't, didn't come to fruition, so that's how we've arrived. Our family's done a lot of 
residential developments, not a lot, but some residential developments. So that's how we've come to this residential use. And I think that's a good, good use of the property. Uh, I think there's residential now on three sides, on three sides, maybe four sides of the property. So um, here we have a good plan proposed. Uh, I can answer your question. The, there have been some questions about the homeowner association. Uh, that hasn't been, the way in my mind this process goes was we asked for this conditional use of, of a residential use first before we even give any thought to any of the specifics. So, uh, but in the discussions with the neighbors, we, we've, they've given me some suggestions and then I agree to some, didn't agree to some others. So that's where we stand there. I think the biggest mitigative uh, use that I've offered is a 10, 10 foot buffer of evergreens along what would be my east property line all the way down Mason Bill's west property line. Any, any questions? Mr. Well, Cole? that maybe addressed one thing. I know that one email came from an individual who was right on that wall and from a noise standpoint and ingress, egress standpoint. So that was one of the things I had questions on. I appreciate that. Okay. Any other questions of the applicant? No other questions? All right. Uh, I'm going to, if you'll step back, I will open it as a public hearing. And, uh, all right, anyone wishing to speak to this particular application? Public hearing, now is your opportunity. If you would identify yourself, please. I'm Jay Logan. I live at 102 Mason DeVille. Um, I, uh, I, I spoke to the Planning and Zoning Committee about this uh, when, it, when it arose, when I learned about the development next door to me. I live at 102, which is the southeast corner, so my property line borders the southeast corner of, of this proposed property. Um, at the time, I was trying to find some information about how uh, the layout would be. I, I was unaware of some of the things that were involved there. And I have some concerns because of the grading of the property. And, and currently, right now, the, um, there's a retaining wall. And the difference between Lynn Lane uh, elevation and the back property where corner where mine is is almost 9 or 10 feet, which means that in this case, the driveway that was shown in the earlier map would um, almost put the wheels in the car right next to the windows of my house, up above the window. So I learned a lot about uh, some of the things that I was concerned, I was afraid of, and didn't really know about um, the, the concerns I have with the, with the lights and the and vehicle traffic, uh, noise, proximity just within five feet of, of, my, of my property. Um, <clears throat> after that, um, you know, Mr. Cracker and I, we've met, and several people in our neighborhood have met with him over the time and looked at some, some different uh, options and some, some things that we thought might be agreeable. And, uh, and I think that there are some that are there to, to, uh, to feel like this might be a, 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 you know, a proposal that we could live with. Uh, we do have some concerns about the neighborhood and how it's used, um, not only from the physical side of things with the grading and the development and proximity of the houses to my house or the traffic next to my house and my neighbor's houses, um, but also, uh, you know, the usage of it. I think we are a little bit afraid of what, um, you know, I guess what may, what, what may move in and cause some of those other distractions. Uh, you know, our, um, our intent in moving to that area with our HOA was to protect some of the things that we have in place with um, who is there, uh, that, that might be a, a student rental or something or a rental property that causes some distraction and noise and sort of take away from that traditional neighborhood that we've had there for 10 years and Riddle Run, which is new across the street and the concerns that they have with that. Um, you know, I understand it's commercial now and, and, uh, and, and it could be something different uh, whether, whether this is approved or something else is decided to be done. So we kind of look at a lot of different, uh, th a lot of different things that are in place that uh, you know, would, would, would guide us, but we're, we're just having concerns and hesitations about what this may look like, or having some safety nets that might be able to protect us from the decisions that are made um, going forward if this is approved. Um, I, think, I think just proximity to, to where I am, and speaking for our neighbors, um, uh, the concerns about that and the, and the property values that may change with uh, particular um, residents that maybe move in or how that's, how that's controlled. 
uh, would be a concern of ours as well as the physical development of the property so it's not causing any other problems with our with our neighborhoods okay thank you thank you anyone else George Berry, 52 Riddle Run. Uh, my wife and I moved from Browning Creek into Starkville. Uh, I guess you call it downsizing. And one of the important parts of that decision was where? <coughs> Riddle Run, Mason DeVille offered that particular environment. We're not objecting to students, but we did not want to live in student housing. And I'm afraid what's getting ready to happen is we're getting ready to put student housing in the middle of all of it. It doesn't take a mathematician. 280,000, three bedrooms, rental, that student housing just waiting to happen. I appreciate it if you all would say, let's slow down, let's look at the development and see what really needs to be done because you're getting ready to approve student housing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, anyone else? Anyone else? Uh, <clears throat> my name is Tommy Cobb. Uh, my wife, Laura Lee, and I live in the uh, Mason DeVille neighborhood where we lived for four years. Uh, and we see it as single family residential, non-rental. Uh, we had previously lived, well, first let me say, I appreciate each and every one of you being here. And after my five year brief stint on the school board, I gained a new appreciation <laughs> for y'all being willing to sit up here and, 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 and be here and listen to people like me have a comment and so forth. But I do appreciate, irrespective of your, if your opinion agrees with mine or not, I do appreciate what you do. But anyway, my wife and I <clears throat> have lived there for four years. We see it as single family residential non-rental. And I think what the gentleman from Riddle Run just mentioned, I think what's getting ready to happen is rental property, uh, a high density rental property, more or less kind of a glorified apartment uh, right there in the neighborhood, where, which, which we see as single family residential. And after having lived in the Sherwood Forest neighborhood for uh, 24 years, 28 years, uh, and having had a rental house next to me for three or four years of that, it just seems to me that the rental apartment situation, it does not lend itself to that environment. And I appreciate your consideration of, of giving that some evaluation. Thank you, sir. All right, anyone else? Anyone else? husband Tom and I live in Maison de Ville. We've lived in Maison de Ville for five years now. And, um, you know, I feel like that Maison de Ville and Riddle Run and then also the development that Mr. Fournay is going to develop have solid value. Um, and that's through our HOA regulations that we've chosen to, to have. And then also to be aesthetically good looking for our property and to keep them up well. And, you know, I think any anything going into that development that's adjacent to all those developments will benefit from our value that we've made decisions on. And you know, if if anything uh, goes in there and does not have the same regulations as us, I feel like it will negatively impact our our development and Riddle Run and Mr. Fournay's. <coughs> Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Anyone else? All right. I'm going to close it as a public hearing. Um, discussion by the board. Alderman Sistron. I have a question for Mr. Haviland um, regarding parking. Um, there's proposed eight units, and how much parking would be available for each unit? Uh, well, the parking would be determined, and the requirement would be determined by the number of bedrooms. Okay. Uh, so and and there's point, space. Uh, there's space to accommodate. Yeah, as you can see, just on this, I mean, without knowing what the number of bedrooms is, and not knowing if that's a garage underneath or any of those kind of details, they have made space in the rear. If you look at the top of the screen here, and then at the bottom, and then on the side of those two. 
there is space for some surface parking and I'm assuming some possible space for underneath parking, but without having the house plans, I wouldn't know that. And the parking is dictated by the number of bedrooms. Right. And that is usually reviewed and uh, verified at the permanent building permit stage. Okay. Anyone else? Alderman Walker. Thank you, and I would like to, to point out that the decision, whatever decision that the board makes tonight is a land use decision and not a, we're not reviewing this site plan in particular because that could change. What we're referring to is correct city attorney is that we'll be making a land use decision correct. about going from commercial to uh, residential. Um, I appreciate uh, Mr. Cracker being here tonight and try to answer questions and I met with a number of the the, the residents that live in Maison de Ville and Real Run to, to try to see uh, where we are, um, where they are in terms of uh, meeting with Mr. Cracker to find what some conditions might be. Um, and if y'all bear with me, I'm gonna read. Uh, th they proposed eight different conditions um, of which I believe seven have been somewhat ag agreed to uh, with some uh, maybe changes. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just read those real quickly to sort of kick off the conversation um, and then we can, we can proceed from there. Um, the first condition was uh, one very similar to what uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, established was there shall be a maximum of eight single family detached residential lots developed in the subject neighborhood. Uh, and I would say ultimately because it's gonna be a condo, it's not a lot, it's just gonna be eight single family detached uh, houses in the subject neighborhood. Number two, all lots in the subject property will be single family detached residential houses constructed with comparable building materials and finishes consistent with established adjacent property at Maison de Ville and Riddle Run and the proposed Andy Fournay development. Three, the DRC shall examine the site plan to ensure proper use of mitigative techniques are used to eliminate adverse impacts to neighboring property owners as much as practically feasible. That was a, um, a condition that was placed by planning and zoning. Four, the grading and drainage improvements required for the development of the subject property shall be engineered to perform and function in a manner that will not result in stormwater runoff into the adjacent Maison de Ville residential units to the east of the subject development and will incorporate all necessary mitigated techniques needed to prevent adverse impacts to the established adjacent property at Maison de Ville and the proposed Andy Fournay development. Five, when negative impacts are imminent and cannot be mitigated, a building foundation, sidewalk, parking, driveway, or road three foot higher than that of Maison de Ville building elevation, the subject property shall incorporate a site development design and plan with a minimum of 10 foot buffer yard at towards the Maison de Ville West property line. This buffer yard shall have placed within its space a sufficient number of evergreen trees or similarly agreeable landscaping, greenery properly spaced that produces a mature width of at least four feet and a height of 15 feet or higher. And if negative impacts are imminent, other suitable fencing or walls shall be installed to provide a solid privacy barrier toward the western property lines of Maison de Ville. Six, there shall be either no east facing windows or consideration for acceptable windows based on the distance from the west property lines and homes located at the subject property so as to protect individual property owners' privacy. And then the last condition, the developer of the subject property shall be available to meet with adjacent property owners during a six month period review for the conditional approval and obtaining final site plan. Uh, I say all that to say that if this were to be approved tonight, I think this would be the basis for the conditions that, that would be uh, a, assigned to the property. Um, and I believe a lot of those conditions have been agreed upon. The 10 foot buffer yard uh, has been agreed upon. Um, many of those conditions are agreed upon. The one condition um, that I think uh, that we've received the most comments about, and I think are the, the biggest, one of the biggest concerns, and you heard it mentioned tonight in the public hearing, is the potential for this property to be rental units. Um, that was something that uh, the, the two parties couldn't come to an agreement on. So city attorney, I'm gonna ask, I'll ask you or city, uh, the city planner to address that. Outside of a homeowners association covenant or a condominium uh, association covenant, does the city get into the, how can we enforce or can we enforce um, a rental type of agreement in a, in a covenant or a condominium association? The conditional use ordinance is broad to allow you guys to attach conditions to oppose proposed conditional use and since such a condition would go to the land use as to what type of residential land use it would be I think the board could attach that condition of no rental if that's what it so desired okay thank you um, I think uh, one of the things that I this this property as we're beginning to, to see about uh, currently is on C2 
Um, there are a number of different options that are allowable by right in C2. And just to better help inform the board and maybe the, the, the public, um, could we walk through uh, what the different scenarios might be for how this property might develop? Um, if, if approved tonight, if this uh, conditional use is approved tonight with these conditions, obviously um, it sets the, the foundation for this to be single family, detached housing, whatever the conditions are. If this condition, uh, conditional use tonight were to be denied, then the property is still C2 and could be developed um, throughout that. Correct. If, and I'm gonna make a, an assumption here, if um, uh, that is the case, and if in December or thereabouts in the next several months, the new unified development code is adopted, can you walk through what those scenarios might be of what would be allowed by right and or special exception on this piece of property? Sure. Uh, the C2 zoning is basically kind of like a general business, almost like a highway classification. So anything that you see that develops on Highway 12 or even on Louisville Street would be, for the most part, allowed by right. Uh, car dealerships, uh, retail stores, uh, similar to like a dollar type store, strip centers. Um, it's, it's a wide range of commercial uses that are currently allowed in a C2. The proposed zoning is a traditional neighborhood new. Uh, traditional neighborhood new is defined as primarily, you know, single dwelling detached houses, but with very limited commercial activity. And by limited, it's limited in the use and in the size and intensity of that use. So that would bring it down to where you could have like a professional office, but it's kind of limiting the amount of square footage that that professional office could actually be. Um, the, can we expand any further into that or in the process wise? Well, and maybe not so much process, but so it could be single by right. It could be single family detached housing of which the units are roughly eight units per acre, which is what yep. this, the site is roughly one acre in size. Yep. Um, so from a density perspective, they would be able to do by right, similar to what's currently being proposed. Similar is currently proposed and similar to what Mason DeVille. I, I believe it's 5,500 square feet uh, is the minimum lot size that we're proposing for a traditional neighborhood new. So if you divide that by the acreage, it gets you right around eight. Okay. And again, just uh, to walk through what the, that other scenario might be, with a special ex a special exception, you are allowed to do uh, some duplex um, and row house or townhouse mm -hmm. types of development that would be some more similar to what Riddle Run is across the street, which is a duplex. Can you just walk us through that and what the density of that might look like? Yeah, with the duplex, uh, for a duplex, duplex in a development, there's a certain percentage of units that would be allowed to be a duplex. For the row houses, it's kind of the same thing. There's a, there's a minimum lot size to determine how many units you would get on it. And I believe when uh, we were talking through this earlier, it would be around six to eight units if it were a townhouse row house. Which a townhouse row house is what you actually think of. It's an up and down thing. You enter through the bottom and the second floor is part of that unit separated by a wall. But it would be a maximum of two stories in height. Correct. In the current proposed code. In yes. the current proposed code that if approved. So uh, all that to say is that I think there are a number of sort of factors at play here that uh, makes this a very difficult decision, quite frankly, um, on, on what to do. Uh, I think you have, one, if we approve this tonight with conditions in place, um, it locks in that it will be single family detached housing, which I believe are, is a uh, would be favorable for the neighborhood in terms of matching the identity of Maison de Deville. Um, if it's denied, you have at least a few more months where it has the opportunity to still develop as C2. Um, and in order for that to happen, what would an applicant have to, to do? They would have to turn in a, the first step in the development of that site, because it would be more than a thousand square feet of anything built, would be to get an approved site plan. So if an, a, a complete application is turned into the city within the 30 days of the approval by the board, then it would still fall under that ordinance. And by complete application, that means a complete set of drawings that are ready to be reviewed and could possibly be approved if everything were okay. And then once that uh, site plan approval is given, I wanna say it's a 12 month period that it would remain active. And within those 12 months, if they obtain building permits, then it's, it's still active. Okay, so if it were to be denied, you have uh, commercial still available for until the Unified Development Code is adopted. Um, at some, we think that's gonna hopefully happen before the end of this year. Once that's adopted, 
then it becomes traditional neighborhood new, where, you're, where then you're required to develop single family, detached, and or with some uh, ramification or some opportunity for duplex and townhouse development within that same lot. Um, what else, are there other things from these conditions that I, that I just read that would be similar to what that, uh, what that would be required by, by right? With the single family, uh, there wouldn't be too many of those conditions would really go there because a single family would be built on its own lot or one house on the entire lot. Yeah, yeah no buffer. If there were, uh, I believe, uh, if it goes to townhouse, row house, there is some conditions in there that require like a buffer between the two properties. And just speaking from memory, the buffer, I believe, currently is set at a type C which is a 20 foot landscape buffer with a wooden fence or a 10 foot buffer with a masonry wall. That's if it were to be townhomes. Is if that it were right? to be townhomes. Okay. And uh, I can't speak to what they were in the, the limited commercial uses, but there were similar buffer requirements in that too. And one thing we forgot to mention is um, this uh, concept of the um, cottage, cottage court, court yes. is a style of development we have proposed. Um, it has to meet much more stringent requirements and, and conditional standards. But that is also a, would be a special exception, which is currently known as conditional use. Could be a process they could go through. So this, this exact so to make sure that I'm hearing you right, but what is being proposed tonight in the site plan, even though we're not making a decision right. on the, the site plan, if what's being proposed there would be allowed by special exception under the cottage style, which has additional additional Stand. standards and those additional standards are they control everything from the actual square footage of it the number of bedrooms the the width of the courtyard uh, the, number of porches, the, the porches of which direction they face the actual architectural finish that the buildings can't be repeated they have to architecturally change um, so there's a lot of uh, stuff like that that's incorporated into the condo court development stuff Okay, and that sounds a little bit like uh, what condition number two, where it says constructed with comparable to building materials. So it seems like it's getting at more sort of architectural feel of what that's looking like. Correct. Okay, um, I think that I think that, I think some of the concerns that I had after meeting with the the neighbors uh, are are have been brought out in some of the conditions that have been discussed, and I think. The biggest concern is how do you deal with the grade issue um, and what that does in, in terms of putting lights or, or noise over into the development. I think the 10 foot buffer um, begins to get you there and I think the real question is what is going to be um, the most suitable for the, the neighborhood moving forward. Um, is it the development that we have some idea of what it's going to be or is it um, the unknown with other additional standards that may, that may be there and I'm open to hear anybody else's opinion on that. Um, Alderman Carver, I thought I saw your hand. My opinion is everything else, one through seven, has been, you know, really the issue is the non-rental, you know, type house or structure, and that's something I was going to ask for a condition. Can we add that tonight? I don't even know if the applicant would be, you know, in favor of that and just withdraw his application, but can we put a condition that states that it cannot be, or it has to be a non-rental and meet all of these other conditions that you also listed? Can that be done legally? I mean, can. and that's something that, I guess I want to hear from the board why, just how they feel about that. And I'm not sure, has the applicant been told this before this meeting that that may even be an, an option tonight? I don't, I don't know. Any, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Idea. I know that they were, my understanding is that it was presented with that option and did not agree to that option. Okay. All right. We had, we don't have a motion. We don't have a second. So let's see if there's. Well, let's, 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 let's well but we're going to go back into discussion. I'll go back and I just want to see if we've got a, a motion and a second to even move this forward at all. So do we have a motion? Not at all. Okay. Has given the nature. Uh, Alderman Little. I don't know if, if we say we're going to ban the rentals and I, and I get and I get that argument that that solves the problem from a parent buying it and allowing his child and a couple other friends live in it. I don't know that, that solves the problem. We've got that going on all over town, and I don't know that we can control that. You know, we, it may sound good and give, make everybody feel better, but I don't think some level of confidence that it's going to solve the problem. Um, you know, uh, I feel like, you know, I, I believe someone in your neighborhood has recently bought in Mason DeVille and, and probably one of their two college kids living there before long. Um, you know, I don't know if, if that's going to solve that, that issue. Um, 
you've got C2, you could have a, a, a Dollar General there. I don't think that it's big enough, but you know, pick your poison. Do you want to wait till January? And if this, this the new plan passes, and do you want townhouses looking down into your subdivision? So I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's, I don't know how much dictate how much the neighbors and Jason probably can dictate to another landowner what you're going to put if they if they've got it by right because they won't have to come back if the if the code passes in December, they're not going to have, have to ask for permission. They they'll have it by right. And, and won't have to necessarily listen to the conditions that y'all suggested. So I think we need to be mindful of that as well. Well, Carver, I saw your hand. Well, I, it's not really related to Airbnb, but it, you know, I'm gonna bring some of this back up. <laughs> I see your face. You know, it is an interesting. This is just a point I'm thinking is, you know, it's interesting that we can talk about comparable architectural facade. We can talk about compatibility of a neighborhood, and basically, you don't want something to stand out like a sore thumb. But the same thing goes for rental. I mean, why wouldn't it apply that, you know, if it's traditionally single family, traditional residential homes, you wouldn't. I don't think anybody on this board would want, uh, you know, uh, it just doesn't fit with the compatibility of everything going down that road. So it is, I mean, that's from another standpoint, but you know, I, I support the residents for the most part. I mean, that's what our question was, the applicant, has he heard this? Because uh, this is board four, mm -hmm. correct? And that's what my, my question was, has the applicant heard that condition and is he in favor or not in favor of it because I mean that's something that we're talking about comparable architectural facade it would say the same thing in rentals you know do you want to have rentals in single family would you want to have rentals in Timber Cove or Greenbrier or any neighborhood that's single family residential so it's, it's an interesting concept but I, I tell you where I'm leaning to it I don't know if you're gonna make the motion or I'll wait on you no I was gonna say if it's, uh, if it's Alderman Walker's ward I would like to understand and hear the motion that you might present tonight so. A little less if I second. recall back when Mr. Fournay was, and it was pretty contentious in front, uh, with the Sherwood Forest neighbors uh, when his, with his project on South Montgomery, um, that we, with the new place type settings, place type maps, this is a transitional, this is transitioning to, to residential as you go to the east because you've got, you know, you've got the uh, Ameriprise, the investment office there, you've got new doctor's office going up, and you've got other business offices, commercial, transition, you know, professional offices, transitioning to some condos and um, residential single family housing. So that's just what, the, that's the character of the area. And, and then you get across Montgomery and you've got pure residential. So, how you? All right. Anyone else? Anyone else? Sister. And, and I'd like to say to the residents um, adjacent to this proposed property that some of the things that will need to be hammered out that will impact y'all greatly uh, will happen during the design review process. Parking being one of them. When, when I live in a neighborhood that is transitional, it's um, started out as single family and a good many of the properties have become long-term rentals. We have one or two short-term rentals in there now. But the, the problems come less from who lives in the houses than the number of cars and a lack of parking. Um, and so that's, um, that's something that um, I don't think attached with conditions tonight, but some, certainly something to be mindful of. That's why I was asking about, is, is that lot big enough to accommodate eight three-bedroom houses and um, parking for those 24 bedrooms and the cottage court that you're looking at. And y'all are telling me um, that it will it will fit within that area. Theoretically, it could fit, but parking generally drives your site design to right. some extent. Parking and then the drainage and infrastructure things. That and the thing that, as Alderman Walker mentioned, as we started this, this is a this is Land a conditional use. use for a residential use in a C2. So this is a zoning matter as opposed to right. development of a site plan, et cetera, et cetera. Alderman Walker, um, I think one of the one of the the concerns that I think many of the residents had coming into this was is that there's so is the unknown of you not knowing what's going to be there um, because there hasn't been uh, a lot of engineering or other design work uh, really fleshed out. Um, and that, so that is part of the way this process is set up, fortunate or unfortunate, is that for this conditional use, and city planner, you correct me anywhere I misspeak, but the way that this uh, is set up is 
we're, we're approving a, a land use without having uh, maybe a lot of those facts in terms of how much earthwork is really needed. Can you really get that number of units on the site? And you're having to make those decisions without having a lot of the, um, the due diligence on that site really play out. So I think what these conditions would att attempt to do is sort of set the framework of what is the, the maximum or the most that we're willing to allow. In this case, it sets the density at eight. It could be that it's six, but we know that it can't be any more than eight. Um, and those part of those factors will be determined by um, when you actually do your, your site plan and it goes through the design review committee. Uh, at that point, they will make sure that the grading and drainage part works out. Um, but what is, what is less known is how do you deal with making sure that the, the, the site plan is going to be conducive with being compatible. I would say the single family nature of it, and on that end, I would say that it feels like it's, uh, it's, it's compatible. Um, but that's going to ultimately be the, the execution of, of, of how it's actually uh, constructed and, and built. Um, can I ask a question of the applicant? Yes, Mr. Cracker, would you come up, please? I don't want to put words in, in your mouth, but the conditions that, that I read, or I believe, are what were presented uh, to you from the, the, the neighborhood. Um, and in those conditions, um, do you agree with the ones that I read, uh, that you would agree to the 10-foot buffer, uh, how you're going to the eight maximum units dealing with the grading and drainage improvements, and et cetera? Yes. And can you talk to me a little bit about uh, why the hesitation for the, the non-rental part of the agreement? Yes, uh, glad to share the, the market should take care of itself with the rentals. Uh, the price, it starts with the price of the, the dirt, you know, the location as a premium. And so with all the infrastructure and the price of a house upon completion at $280,000 is the proposed price range for a 1,400 square foot, three bedroom, three bath. That really doesn't work. You're not gonna see a lot of people buying those just to rent, the, those numbers just don't work. So that, I understand that concern, but that the market should take care of itself on that. And so as a developer, I wasn't and really not willing to limit myself to the potential buyer on the front end uh, by saying no rentals at all, because what if a, a parent buys it for their child living during school and then the child moves away and then they could keep it as an investment. That's just a property right that, that everybody should have. Uh, so that's the reasoning behind not agreeing to that on the front end like this. And this may be a question for Mr. Havlin. At what point in this process um, is the, the condo association, does that have to be formed? And what, is, what does that process look like? And, and how is it similar to establishment of covenants for this neighborhood? That is a uh, part of when they actually get ready to condo plat it which a condo plat does not go before the board alderman. It's just approved by staff based on the requirements in the ordinance. And one of those is requirements that they turn covenants in with that plat. Thank you. Uh, so one, uh, one other question, uh, and this is for the city planner, um, would be if this were to be denied tonight and they were to develop it under the traditional neighborhood new, um, and they meet the requirements uh, of that. There might be a buffer requirement. There may be ingress, egress. There's gonna be size limitations on the houses. Is there going to be anything in that language that is going to prevent the, any of those properties from being rented? No. All right, thank you. All right, any further discussion? Do we have a motion? I think the, the real question for, for me comes down to uh, what is going to be in ultimately the best interest of the, the neighborhood. Um, and I would say I've struggled with this one because I don't think there's a clear cut, I don't think there is a clear cut answer. Um, I think if you deny this property uh, or deny this request um, with this conditions that have been agreed upon of which I think the neighborhood is in agreement uh, with the, the, I think the biggest uh, discrepancy is the, the rental. Um, if this property were to be to deny tonight or this conditional use, it could be developed uh, at the, when the Unified Development Code is approved. Um, and many of these conditions that are in here would be either taken up by some of that, whether it's gonna be a buffer or the architectural standards, but you're still gonna be giving up the, the rental piece because that's not going to be part of the requirement. 
Um, and so I've, I've struggled with what to do and what is truly in the best interest of the, the neighborhood. Um, and, I, and I'm not sure. I think where I, where I maybe come down to it is I believe there might be more, uh, there may be a little more teeth in the new code when it gets passed. There may not be. Um, if it meets everything by right, it may be very much similar to what we're having here. Are there limitations in the size or a minimum size of those units in the new code? Well, just, just to make sure that we're clear, the cottage style development is a special exception under the new code currently. Um, and yes, it does limit the actual footprint and the overall square footage of each house that's in, within the development. So by special exception, you mean that it would be brought back before the board for Correct. some type of... And with the special exception under the proposed code is there's additional standards that are listed. Those additional standards have to apply. Like you just have to do them. And those additional standards are like the, the architectural features, Correct. things that are built into this code. Okay, we're, we're in need of a motion. We don't have a motion and we take no action on this item and move to the next item. All right. Mayor, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make them, I think this is, I think we're fairly close to coming to some con, uh, reconciliation between both the developer and the, um, uh, the residents of the neighborhood. I would like to suggest that we take this uh, motion under further, or this matter under further advisement to be taken up at the, the next meeting. If we can hammer out a few more of these, the particulars, and see where we are. Okay, so that is a motion to table this until November the 5th? Yes. Okay, so I have a motion to table this matter until <coughs> November the second. 5th. I have a second from Alderman Little. Further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, it's unanimous. Thank you. All right, moving to the next item. We have a public hearing to determine whether or not the building 19 of Brooksville Garden Apartments located. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a public hearing. I have to, I have to hold, hearing, but I, I appreciate that. All right, let me hold a public hearing on this matter. Um, this is a matter regarding Brooksville Garden Apartment located 305 Everglade Avenue with parcel number 118K-00-015.00 is a menace to the public health, safety, and welfare of the community. Do I have anyone in the audience who wishes to speak to this matter? Anyone in the audience wishing to speak to this matter? Seeing none, I'll close it as a public hearing. Uh, Dr. Kim, I don't believe anybody wants a presentation necessarily, so I have a motion for approval from Alderman Little. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Alderman Sistrom. Further discussion by the board? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? It is unanimous. Thank you so much. All right. Next item is uh, mayor's business. Okay. And this is one, guys, that, that uh, kind of quasi came from uh, an article in the Clarion Ledger, which uh, was noted that there are a lot of uh, restaurants down in Jackson that um, allow, have allow, allowed dogs on their patios, on their outdoor patios. And the article was basically saying that this is uh, not a legal action, and um, I was noting that there are numerous restaurants <coughs> in the city of Starkville that also do the same, from uh, Ben 612, the City Bagel, back when it was a, uh, it was a going concern, 929 now, The Grill, uh, Camp House, any number of our uh, restaurants allow them on the outdoor patios. And it distresses me that we would have our restaurants that were not following the law. And so uh, in thinking about it, I talked to our representatives, Representative Robertson and Representative Taylor, and they both said that this is something that they could support going forward to get a local and private. This does not require any of that. This merely allows uh, restaurateurs, if they wish to do so, to allow dogs on their open air patios. And I think it's worthy of note that service animals now are allowed both inside and outside. So it's not as though that there is, you know, not the opportunity for dogs to be in the vicinity of restaurants, whether outside or inside. So um, that is what this is about. Um, I just thought I would bring it forward to the board because I, and I got, and I talked to restaurateurs. There's a letter in our packet that uh, a number of the restaurateurs in town have, particularly the ones who allow dogs on the patio, um, have said that they think this is something that enhances their business. So, Alderman Carver? Well, I say I think I'm probably leaning toward this, but for the reason that it's at the discretion of the business owner. Uh, if something hurts their business, I think in time you'll see that it's something that some businesses may shy away from that others don't, and they embrace. Second thing, the really only thing concerned when I was reading through my packet, it says 
Number three in the resolution, it says that the state of Mississippi has adopted the Uni United States Public uh, Health Service Food Code, which was adopted in whole section under 6 501. It does not allow dogs other than service animals. So this be something that we specific to the city of Starkville alone, and has any other city in the state of Mississippi applied for this type of resolution? No, they have not. We, I like to lead. We are leading in this one. However, uh, the state of Florida, the state of Tennessee, Illinois, Washington, Washington, uh, Washington D.C., um, Oregon, California, any number of other states have led this, already led this charge because the, that, that particular code section has applied to the entire United States because all states have adopted that code wholesale. And so each one of the states have individually made that change. So that's the reason I thought that, you know, and I spoke to M the people at MML uh, and while they were here at a, at a conference, and they said that this is something that they could conceivably support and might do so. But as it stands right now, um, I thought this would be an opportunity for us to have a local and private. Alderman Little? I don't have a problem supporting this tonight. I've seen in the packet where we've got the local restaurant owner supporting it. Uh, they can make that decision. If it impacts them negatively, they can they can uh, do away with it. So let's let, let them call the shots on that as far as their patio and patios go. Okay. Thank you. Any further further conversation? Do I have a motion? Move approval. I have a second. motion from Alderman Sistron. Do I have a second? Second. Alderman Little. Further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay, by a vote of four to two, motion carries. Um, second is the consideration of the median maintenance. Move approval. Uh, we, we have to make one, one, one caveat. In your packet, um, the, there were some, um, there was one that did not match all the others and it had to have a strikeout. And so with the caveat that the, all four of them would match for each segment that was in here, uh, we'll go back and make that mark out, that strike through. And, and I'll, I'm sorry. Um, it's on the table, too. The yeah, it's that's, that's where I was going to go. Uh, yeah, it's at the table. Um, and Mr. Latimer has looked at them and um, has passed off on them with the one exception that we'll make it marry up. It's uh, the, I think it was the Highway 12? The Highway 12 Highway contract. Highway 12 contract needed that's to right. scratch something. So um, we, will, we will make that happen. So. And, and Mary, can I yes. just move? Yes. So, what happened was we redlined these agreements late last week before the work session and we took out all the objective provisions that the AG says that the city shouldn't enter into, the hold harmless, the indemnification, the limitation of liability, the arbitration provisions. And they had a provision in there that said if the city doesn't pay within 10 days, it's, it's late. Well, state statute gives you 45 days, so we right. changed that too. They incorporated all of those changes except on one contract for Highway 12, they called it Nash Street. So they just got to change the name on that. The other three are at the table, and the fourth will mirror these three. Yes. So it was just a, basically a typo. So, and Second. I think I heard a motion. Second. Oh, where did I get my first motion? Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Thank you, Alderman Carver and Alderman Little. Thank you. Um, further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next under board business, this is the issuance of the public improvement bonds for the um, park, recreation, and tournament facility. And I move approval. This is just the next step in the process. Okay. I have a motion from Alderman Sister. I have a second from Alderman Little. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. All right. By a vote of four to two, motion carries. All right. Next we have uh, approval. Okay. I have a motion calling for a public hearing. Um, Okay, you're going to public I'm hearing sorry. again? Okay. Wait, oh, no, no, no. This is calling for a public hearing. This is just calling for a public okay. hearing on actually the next four are calling for public yes. hearings on various and sundry um, addresses that have been identified by code enforcement. Um, so we can wait until the next time to have a presentation or we can have it now. Alderman Sistrunk, you had well, wanted to. And, and I wanted to second this motion okay. for, for um, this and the. Um, if it's all right, we could do all four of them at once. But I would like to call out the addresses, if you don't mind. Sure. If, if, if you would do I'm that. I'm happy to do that. Just so that um, people are very aware of properties. None of them are in, none of them are inhabitable. Um, they're they're in terrible repair and do need to um, do need to, to be taken yes. away. And I'm happy to do that. The first one is 202 McKinley Street. The second one is uh, 333 Long Street. Third one is 606 Whitfield Street, and the fourth one is 722 Vine Street. And each one of those has a parcel number that's included in the packet. But um, would y'all can we take this together? 
you can if, to make sure they're itemized though. Okay, all right. We will, we will itemize them with the not only the parcel number but the address. And I have a motion and a second for all four. Okay. I see not, head nodding, so that would be incorporate all four of those, including those parcel numbers, which we will put in the minutes in that form. Um, all right, discussion? I've got a question for Dr. Kelly. Off of these, yes. there's another property. So while we're looking at so many properties, what is that little house on 12 next to the whole change place? It's just the one across up. from Sonic? Yeah. It's yeah. boarded up. Uh, is there anything yeah, we can do with that? It's boarded up. We can, we can certainly look at it. It's been there. It, yes, it, ha it has been there for quite a while. So, okay. well, we and there are a number of others to, around town. Yes. This sir. motion has all four in one. It does. Okay. Okay. All right. Further discussion. Seeing none. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. All right. Motion carries. Thank you. It is unanimous, and that is for all four parcels. All right. Under planning, we also have a special event request for the frostbite ma half Little marathon. I have a motion from Alderman Little. Do I have a second? Second. Second, second from Alderman Walker. Mayor, I've got one suggestion. Yes, sir. The proposed motion is with the condition that proof of insurance is provided. I just want to add, with the condition that proof of insurance with coverage meeting the city's special event policy is provided a minimum of 20 days prior to the event. Okay. You accept that, that yes. amendment? Okay. All right. So I have a motion uh, and a second further discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? I already see you out Nay. training, Brad. I said you already see you out Especially training. Man. Oh, okay, oh, yes, sir, thank you. Okay. Okay. By a vote of four to two, motion that. carries. I'm Good. sorry, what what do we got I'll going on here? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, next item is a request for a final plat approval of phase one for Portico subdivision on the north side of Garrett Road. Uh, Mr. Haviland, are you making a presentation on that one? Ms. Corbin's making a presentation. Let's talk about um, this is a request for final plat by Crosstown Builders for the Portico Phase 1. Um, this request for Phase 1 will consist of 18 lots. The property is located in an R3A zone. The entire subdivision consists of approximately 11.04 acres with the proposed 51 lots. Um, give me just a second. 18 lots. Gotcha. Okay, so that's the whole lot. Um, phase one is approximately 4.61 acres with 18 lots. The development as a whole has a gross density of 4.62 units per acre. All easements and dedications are shown on the plat. The road name has been preliminarily approved for use. Electrical water and sewer service um, is provided by the city of Starkville. And this is the plat just for reference. Um, and on October 8th, 2019, the Planning and Zoning Commission voted 4-0 to recommend approval with 15 conditions. Um, those are listed on the slide right here. Um, if, yeah. And of the conditions, the first 14 are pretty standard conditions for a final plat for a subdivision. Condition number 15 was specifically added by TNC, and it was just to add the lot size on each lot of the plat. Is that all, Ms. Corbin? Yes. Okay. Is the applicant here? There you go. Would you like to come up and share some words of wisdom with us? Sure. <laughs> hey, um, my name is Trey Pace. Um, I live in Madison, um, but uh, we're excited to come up here and get involved in the building process. And so okay. We're ready to go. Hopefully okay. we're, we're good to go. Any questions of the applicants? All right. Thank you. Just wanted to, want to give you the opportunity. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank we're you. we're excited. Right. Further discussion from the board? Do I have a motion? May I move approval? I have a motion from Alderman with Walker. Con, with yes. recommended with conditions, conditions by the planning and zoning committee. Okay. Second. Second from Alderman Little. Further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Well, motion carries. It is unanimous. Um, claims docket next. Move approval. Thank second. you, sir. A motion for approval from Alderman Sistrunk, a second from Alderman Little. Discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. All right, by vote of four to two, motion carries. And I believe that takes us to the end. Mayor, move to adjourn. Ah, uh, well, let me read out my work session, if you don't mind, please. Um, board will be meeting on at a work session for November the first on November the first for our November the fifth meeting. It'll be on the second floor of City Hall. It is open and uh, open to the public. We will be live streaming that, and uh, the public and and uh, press are invited to attend. Um, a motion to adjourn. Move approval. I have a motion to adjourn from Alderman Walker. Do I have a second? Do 
Everybody wants to adjourn. Second. I need a second. Second. Thank you. Alderman Sistrunk. All those in favor, please sit by saying aye. Uh, opposed. All right, we are in adjournment. Thank you. Good night. Good night.